So this class was, uh, you know, geomechanics. Classically, we call this you know, rock mechanics, right? Um, I guess they, they started using geo when a lot of sort of artificial or synthetic man-made materials came into the mix, primarily like concrete and asphalt and other things. These aren't specifically rocks, right? Concrete is not a rock. You don't find it naturally. But nevertheless, it behaves very, very much like a rock in terms of how... Um, so this sort of all-encompassing word became geomechanics uh, to describe, um, you know, how the, the, the deformation and behavior and failure of rock-like materials, okay? And of course, in this class, we're petroleum engineers, so we're interested in, in reservoir rocks, right? Reservoir, geomechanics, reservoir geomechanics. And so, you know, classically, mechanics, the word mechanics is usually associated with the formulation and solution of problems that deal with conservation of momentum, linear and angular momentum. And you know, when you're talking about rigid bodies or particles, there's another name you might know. Newton's second law. Force equals mass times acceleration. And uh, you've all had statics, right? So in statics, you just work on force equals zero. Right? No acceleration. Force equals zero. Uh, that, that's a static problem or equilibrium problem, but nevertheless, the more generic name is conservation of linear momentum in that case. And of course, when you have a continuous body, I mean, a lot of times we idealize things as rigid bodies. I mean, this table, if I were to you know, lift up on it, more or less move as a rigid body. And so a lot of times we idealize things as rigid bodies, but of course, that wood is the form of it, right? I mean, if I push on it, you can see it move, right? so, okay, a lot of times the, the rigid body assumption is good enough, uh, but if you, you have the formable bodies and you, we basically resolve the conservation of momentum equations on little infinitesimal particles, infinitesimal points within that, and that leads to the mathematical definition of stress. Okay, but today we don't need a mathematical definition of stress. We can use it more colloquially. We all know sort of what stress is. I mean, you've all had mechanics too, right? Uh, engineering mechanics 391, right? Three, three, nine, solid, solid, solid mechanics, right? So in that class, you know, stress is like force divided by area. And, uh, and so, but we, today we don't need it. We're going to talk about tectonic stress or stress on a very large uh, geologic scale. And, and this is still, I mean, it's, it's forces resolved by some area that, that are in the earth, and they come about due to essentially tectonic motion, the motion of the plates and other things. So, you know, why do we care about stress in petroleum engineering? Well, I've got a couple applications. So, one that we'll study, this is one application that we'll study extensively in this class, and it has to do with the stability of welding. In order to get to petroleum fluids, we have to drill a well, and we need that well to remain stable and then, so that we can, you know, and, and so if we know, uh, we can design schemes to make it stable. Right? We, can, we can put casing in and other things. Of course, all that costs money. We want to do this in the most efficient way. So if we know something about the stability of the well bore, then we can hopefully design, you know, the most efficient casing strings or whatnot. And the stability of the well bore depends on the state of stress in the earth, the orientation of the well, the strength of the rock, and other things. And so, uh, you know, this is a classic example of the so-called wellbore breakout because the, the, the earth is under stress due to tectonic motion. We'll talk a little bit about that more where that comes from. And um, and then we'll drill a hole in it. There's actually an intensification of stress. I don't know if you solved any problems with a, with a hole in your solid mechanics class, but you actually have a stress intensity that occurs in any material that's under stress that has a hole in it. And then that intensity, that intensity, that stress intensity can exceed the strength of the rock, and the rock begins to fail. And you can see some cracks here. Right? And so if this becomes, if this failure is great enough, and this material flakes away off into the well bore, and eventually uh, can become so, so much that the well bore will collapse and right? be very bad. In that case, you have to do something to make the casing do something. 
So that's one application where we care about stress in the earth. Um, you know, another another application is uh, we're talking about faults. So faults will slip uh, due to the stress, you know, on the rock, on the fault itself. So essentially, what we're talking about there is the ratio of the normal force, so the, the ratio of the force that pushes into the into this plane versus how much force is acting tangentially to it. And of course, some friction, which is a material property of the rock, essentially. Uh, those things will govern whether the fault will slip. And of course, in this case, it's wrong. Use this cartoon where we're talking about a fault, but it's like a geologic fault. But of course, we have many tiny joint sets and fractures in reservoirs. And in some cases, uh, making, you know, inducing this slip is a very, very good thing. Like in the case of uh, stimulating uh, slip water fracture. Stimulating natural fractures in slip water fracturing. This is a source, we believe, don't know exactly, but this is a source of why we think that uh, oil and gas shale wells are so productive. And, and that we actually, when we produce hydraulic fractures, in addition to that, we stimulate and we cause slip to occur. We have evidence of this, we can make measurements, but we cause slip to occur on naturally, occur, naturally occurring joint sets or rocks. Or Tiny faults. And so that's a good thing. Of course, on the other side, it's a very bad thing when we say inject wastewater and cause large slips to occur on large faults and we induce seismicity. So that's a, that's a fancy word for we produce earthquakes. And of course, this occurs in Oklahoma a lot right now, where a lot of uh, wastewater is being injected into certain locations. <coughs> Um, another thing is that uh, the strength of the rock and the stress in the earth, uh, along with depletion, right? So, you know, rocks have pores in them. That's, those pores contain the fluid we're trying to extract. And as we extract that, right, then the, floor, the pores themselves actually apply a pressure or add some stability or strength to the rock, right? Or, or a, a force that counteracts the force that's trying to compress the rock. Right? That force comes from the earth, essentially, and the tectonic motion. That's the stress. Right? So the pore pressure sort of counteracts that. And if you remove that, if you remove the fluid, then what you can get is sort of you know, the pore wants to collapse. And sometimes that can be a good thing. You can get something that's called compaction drive. So you're removing the fluid, the pore is collapsing, which is you're like squeezing a sponge. That's good. Right? But what's bad is that it subsides, <coughs> right? Uh, if we do that to, to an extent, or if you use like steam flood operations or bitumen in Canada, you can cause the earth, the, the surface of the earth, to subside to an extent that's measurable, right? And if you have structures up there, that'd be bad. Right? You'll see a neat picture. Look up the subsidence craters that occurred in the Yucca Flats north of uh, Las Vegas in, the, in the, 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 the lot of test sites there, where they used to do a whole bunch of underground nuclear testing. So there they would set off a nuclear explosion in the earth, create this massive cavity in the earth, and then the cavity would collapse on itself, and the earth would fall in. And if you look at an aerial photo of that part of the earth, there's a bunch of pop marks. It's pretty interesting. Of course, we don't, it's not that bad with the petroleum reservoir, but you can get measurable subsidence at the surface. And so that's you know, something that we want to avoid if we can. So, you know, this is probably a review from high school even, but the Earth uh, is made up of a, and this is really not the scale, uh, but the crust is really, really thin compared to the rest of the Earth, right? So the, the, the crust uh, is made up, the Earth is made up of a crust, uh, a very, very large molten and liquid phase uh, called, the, the, it's called magma. The magma is, you know, we, we tend to think of it as a completely liquid, but it's in fact it's more liquid sort of, uh, it's more liquid near the core and it's, and it's more solid near, near the crust, okay? And that, that has some implications. And of course, the, the solid iron core and this magma moving around the iron core is what causes the magnetic field um, uh, here in, on Earth. And, and so a more detailed view uh, of the crust so this whole top layer we call the lithosphere. I don't know why I have a, I set this up to use a pen, and I'm, I'm not using it. Um, 
so this uh what happened? So this top area we call the lithosphere. This this includes the crust and the uppermost solid mantle layer. Right? Uh, so that's the lithosphere. Uh, the crust is usually on the average it's somewhere between zero and 100 kilometers thick. Now, <coughs> in the oceans, it can be as thin as even four kilometers. Okay. However, the density of the crust is pretty much uniform. Pretty much uniform throughout the whole surface of the Earth. So how can this be? I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't mean to. Uh, I shouldn't say the density. The, the, yeah, the, the, dense, the density of the Earth, right? the density of the Earth, uh, the, the crust, is, is fairly uniform over the surface of the Earth. So how, how could this happen? Where it's much thicker in some spots, much thinner in others. So it has to do with the composition of the rock, right? So oceanic crust is mostly made up of like basaltic type rocks, whereas the rocks on Earth, uh, I mean on the on the continents rather, are, are more granite type. Right? So so the density is fairly constant, although in some places it's not, and that can lead to stress itself, okay. So stress comes about, uh, one of the ways stress comes about is through this notion of continental drift. So continental drift was an idea that was born somewhere right around 1912, that the idea that you know, the, the Earth used to be made of one supercontinent. Right? And uh, this, this is sort of the precursor to plate tectonics, which is the current accepted theory. Right? And it's not that continental drift was uh, not correct, it's just sort of incomplete in a way. Uh, so the idea that, you know, at some point the, the Earth was one supercontinent, and then over time uh, these continents uh, moved away from each other. So there's a, a picture 200 million years ago, uh, 145 year, million years ago. So this is the time of the dinosaurs, and, and, and one, of the, one of the ways that we know that, or we sort of uh, believe that this theory or was partially correct is that, the dino, you know, the, the, the fossil records sort of, uh, comply with this and that you know we'll find fossils uh, in parts of the in these parts of the earth that sort of indicate that that was once connected or the same part and then um, so then we move forward to the sort of end of the dinosaur era and uh, to today okay so it's not that, again, it's not that continental drift was, was, and I don't know enough about the literature to say that people believe that say that those continents were, say, floating on the ocean. I don't know that anyone believed that. But we didn't really know uh, up until the 60s uh, why or, or how they were moving about exactly. And in the 60s, uh, we began to have quite a few satellites in space. And it turns out that from the space, from satellite images, you can actually see the boundaries, in some cases, of these massive tectonic plates. Right? And so these plates, um, uh, these are these sort of massive plates that move around, typically moving under one another. Typically, the oceanic plates, because they're heavier or, or you know, rather thinner, but with the same density, so they're heavier, they tend to move underneath the continental plates. And uh, in fact, it's pretty hard to see in this picture, but uh, for the, this Juan de Foca plate, which is sort of up here, this is the Juan de Foca plate, which is sort of up there along the coast of Oregon and Washington. Um, it's actually moving under the uh, North American plate, and eventually, uh, in another 50 million years or so, it'll be completely gone. Okay, so this, this small plate here. Moving under, it'll, be disappear, it'll disappear. Okay, and so, um, however, you know, in most of the Earth's four and a half billion year history or so, there's essentially been the same amount of 
across the material. So whenever you have this subduction where you have plates moving under one another, you have regeneration somewhere else. And of course, this is in volcanic activity. Most of that sort of occurs in the ocean, but we also see that in our, uh, in our volcanoes and other things. So we have different types of plane boundaries. These are uh, these. This is a characterization of it. You know, I think maybe it's a good place to stop. So um, it's not quite as far as I wanted to get today, but I'll I'll provide the rest of this lecture and the next lecture as a video for you to watch.